Okay. When you sit down to write, only, there is only one important person in your life. This is someone you'll never meet called a reader. You're not writing to impress your professor. You're writing to impress someone hanging from a strap between Parsons, Green and Putney who'll stop reading given a fifth given a chance in a fifth of a second. So the first, second, the first sentence you write will be the most important sentence in your life, and so will the second and the third. And this is because, although you may feel obliged to write, nobody has ever felt obliged to read. Now, those aren't my words. Those are the words of a journalist by the name of Tim Radford. And Tim Radford is a science writer, and he's put together a brilliant piece. It's on page 29 of your, your um, workbook. It's called A Manifesto for the Simple Scribe. You can find it on The Guardian. If you take nothing away from today's session, read that, uh, because it's the most brilliant piece of writing about writing that I've ever read, and I read a lot of stuff about writing. But the reason why I wanted to open with that quote is because he talks about what it's like to write for a reader that doesn't feel obliged to read. And I think this is the big difference between writing for an academic audience and writing for a lay audience. Your professor, your fellow academics, to some extent, are a captive audience. They're obliged to read your work. The rest of the people out there in the world, they're not obliged. So how do we grab their attention? And that's what I want to share with you today, is some ideas for grabbing the attention of these three people on the tube. But first, I want to start with a little experiment. What I'd like you to do, I'd like you to take a piece of paper, if you all have a, a, a blank piece of paper. I'm going to show you a picture. And what I'd like you to do is write down your response to that picture, and if you can make Make your writing big enough so that if you hold it up, I can see what you've written. So as I say, it's a, it's a piece of art, and I want you to just jot down your interpretation of this piece of art. What do you think this piece of art represents to you? Now, this is not a test of your abilities to read a painting. It's just an experiment to see how you respond to this piece of work. So quickly jot down one or two words of what this picture means to you. As I say, there's no right or wrong answer. Every response is valid. Okay, is anyone willing to share what they've written down? We've got modern recycle. Yeah. Fingers, yeah, yeah, okay. Broken bookmarks or antiquated price tags. I can see that, <laughs> definitely, yes. Aha, okay, someone in the back's made an interesting thing. I'll get, come back to that. Okay, what have we got here? Out of place. Oh, that sounds like a rather negative reaction. Nairobi, I've never had that before. <laughs> Caged. Weird finger dancing. Yeah. Okay, so the lady at the back has written supper. Now, an art historian might have got that. And of course, it's obvious when you see it. So what's the difference between that and that? Well, it's that that is a piece of abstract art. Whereas that, there's no denying what it depicts. And with anything abstract, we all put our own interpretations on what's abstract. But when something is concrete, the message is much clearer. And the same thing happens with language. So what I want to do now is do, to do my second of three experiments of the day, 
which is to look at abstraction in language. So first of all, what I'd like to do is get another blank piece of paper, and I'd like you to draw a pizza. And if you want to just raise your picture of a pizza up when you're done and share, share your... Again, this is not a test of your artistic abilities. Okay, yep. Yep, yep, yep. No surprises here. Oh, someone's put some sort of fluorescent toppings on hers. <laughs> yeah, whenever I do this exercise, Pretty much everyone comes up with that, a circle divided into <laughs> slices with some little blobs representing uh, toppings. Okay, right, another blank piece of paper, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to draw something else. This time what I'd like you to draw is integrity. see furrowed brows and people looking like they can't actually even be bothered to even try and capture integrity. So we've got something that looks like a cube over there. Someone has done a circle. Is it a cube? It's a cube. A cube, yeah. And then integers. And integers, okay. And we have a circle. Something that looks a bit like a caterpillar there. Is it a series of interlocking? Oh, you see, there you go. And we've got a human being here, yeah? Okay, well, whenever I do this, you always get a wide range of responses, whether it's a, a chain or a circle. So this is the sort of thing I've had before. That's typical. And the reason is, Everyone knows what a pizza looks like. You can picture it in your head, but you can't picture integrity. So instead, you have to opt for the next best thing, which is some concrete representation of integrity, some symbol, because it's not something you can actually picture in your mind. And this is pretty much going to be the thrust of what I'm going to be talking about today about the difference between, differences between writing for an academic audience and writing for a lay audience. With a lay audience, you need to think pizza, basically. So I would identify three differences between writing for a scholar and a lay reader. So when you're writing for an academic audience, the language is impersonal. We're taught from a very young age to remove the me, the I, out of our writing. And I don't know if any of you are in the humanities. It's only when you become a really, really successful professor that you can start saying, well, I think, with that confidence. It's abstract, what I've been talking about a lot so far. Academic writing is all about ideas. And it's also hedged. We couch our language to appear not too bold. Whereas with the lay reader, rather than being impersonal, we want to fill it with human beings. Remember the difference between the abstract art and the Last Supper. As I say, concrete, think pizza. And rather than being hedged, capturing a lay audience's attention requires a sense of the dramatic. And what I'm going to do is talk about three different types of writers and how they take the impersonal, the abstract, and the hedged and make it human, concrete, and dramatic. So three types of writers. And I'm going to start with the storytellers. Does anyone recognize either, either of these two handsome chaps? No? So on the right, we have Michael Lewis, who's a journalist who's published quite a few books lately. And um, 
He's absolutely fantastic. He's probably my favourite living writer. On the left, we have Lord Denning, who is probably my famous favourite non-living judge. He's fantastic. And we'll look at examples of their writing in a moment. But first, I want to do my third and final experiment of the day. And I am going to need two volunteers. Two volunteers who don't mind potentially appearing on camera, or if that's a problem, we can edit you out. <laughs> Great, we have one. Come on down. <laughs> Give them a clap. <laughs> oh, your friend decided not to accompany you, so I am going to need another one. Mm? Oh, great. Come, come on down. <laughs> okay, so can you tell me your names? Uh, Noha. Sorry? Uh, Noha. Noha, okay. Helena. Helena. And Noha, what are you studying? I'm doing a PhD. I'm a second year PhD student in the chemical engineering department. The chemical engineering department, okay. I'm a first year PhD student in the genetics department. Great, okay, so what I would like you to do, Noha, would you like to choose red or blue? Blue, blue. blue. okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Normally people choose red, so you obviously... I've chosen blue too. So. There you go, okay, we've got, uh, we've got uh, yeah, independent thinkers here. Okay, so, now don't op open the envelopes. What, what I'm going to do is I will start with the blue, okay. Noha, yep. and what... what this envelope contains, let's have a look, right, it's a short passage and what I'd like to do is read this passage to you mm -hmm. and then we'll have a bit of a chat about it. Okay. Does that sound all right? Yeah. Not too difficult? Okay, so what this passage is, it's from the introduction to the state of the international organ trade, a provisional picture based on integration of available information and it's from the Bulletin of the World Health Organization. Okay. Organ transplantation is an effective therapy for end-stage organ failure and is widely practiced around the world. According to the World Health Organization, kidney transplants are carried out in 91 countries. Around 66,000 kidney transplants, 21,000 liver transplants and 6,000 heart transplants were performed globally in 2005. The access of patients to organ transplantation, however, varies according to their national situations and is partly determined by the cost of healthcare, the level of technical capacity, and most importantly, the availability of organs. The shortage of organs is virtually a universal problem. In some countries, the development of a deceased organ donation program is hampered by socio-cultural, legal, and other factors. The shortage of an indigenous supply of organs has led to the development of the international organ trade, where potential recipients travel abroad to obtain organs through commercial transactions. The international organ trade has been recognised as a significant health policy issue in the international community. A World Health Assembly resolution adopted in 2004, WHA 57.18, urges member states to take measures to protect the poorest and most vulnerable groups from transplant tourism and the sale of tissues and organs. Despite growing awareness of the issue, the reality of the international organ trade is not well understood due to a paucity of data and also a lack of effort to integrate the available information. Okay, so that wasn't a badly written passage. I can tell because I didn't... Um, trip up over my words, and I don't know if this is something that you've discussed over the next few days, over the, over the past few days, but generally, if you get into a habit of reading your work aloud, uh, that's a good habit to get into because it, it irons out those lumps and bumps. But what I'd like to do, let me just grab a pen that I should have had here. Okay, I want to just see what you got from that. I got everything. Oh, great. Okay. Oh. To what I'm working on, so. uh, oh, no. That, well, I've chosen the wrong person then. Okay. So, how many liver transplants were performed globally in 2005? Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, not so confident now, are we, Noha? <laughs> uh, how it's going to be performed? Yeah. How many were performed in 2005? I didn't 
catch the, catch the numbers. Okay. I'm not good in numerics. Okay, well, it was 21,000, so... Okay. So what three factors determine a patient's access to organ transplantation in each nation? In each nation? Mm -hmm. The availability. Yep. Uh, the uh, accessibility, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the three factors. Uh, the third factor is the cost. So the cost of healthcare, I think you didn't quite get the middle one, which is the level of technical capacity. Oh, yeah. Okay. So probably... Two, what, two thirds of a point there. Okay, what hampers the development of a deceased organ donation program in some countries? It's the, uh, I think it's the abusing of the uh, poorest. <laughs> I'm looking for three things socio cultural, legal, and other factors, I'm afraid. So. It's actually so that you can't <laughs> Okay, so what did the World Health Assembly Resolution WHA 57.18 urge member states to do? So there was a, a resolution by the World Health Assembly mm -hmm. in 2004, I believe. What did it urge member states to do? It was, I recall, the, the ethical issues? It was, it was about transplant tourism, specifically to take measures to prevent the poorest and vulnerable groups from transplant tourism and the sale of tissues and organs. So I'll give you half a point there. Okay, so what two things account for the lack of understanding about the reality of the international organ trade? <laughs> what two things account for the lack of understanding about the reality of the international organ trade? Uh, the data. Correct, or the paucity thereof, yeah. Yeah, that's the only thing. Okay. The other thing was a lack of effort to integrate the available information. Mm -hmm. Is it like uh, both of them like, uh, uh, mm? related to each other? I guess they are, yeah. 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 Um, but So I'm going to give you one and two-thirds of a point out of five. Now, don't feel bad about that, because no one else in this room would have done any better. And <laughs> frankly, you did one and two-thirds points better than most people I try this exercise on. So well done. Please stay on. Please, please stay here. Yeah, and and, and watch your partner's humiliation. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ah, so what do we have here? Right, what we have here is a true story. Okay. So a friend of mine is a frequent business traveller. Let's call him Dave. Now Dave was recently in Manchester for an important meeting with clients. Afterward, he had some time to kill before his train, so he went to a local hotel bar for a drink. He'd just finished one drink when an attractive woman approached him and asked if she could buy him another. He was surprised, but extremely flattered, so sure, he said. The woman went to the bar and brought back two more drinks, one for her and one for him. He thanked her and took a sip. And that was the last thing he remembered. Rather... That was the last thing he remembered until he woke up, disorientated, lying in a hotel bathtub, his body submerged in ice. He looked around frantically, trying to figure out where he was and how he'd got there. Then he spotted the note. Don't move, call 999. A mobile phone was sitting on a small table beside the bathtub. He picked it up and called 999, his fingers numb and clumsy from the ice. The operator seemed oddly familiar with his situation. She said, sir, I want you to reach behind you slowly and carefully. Is there a tube protruding from your lower back? Anxious, he felt around and sure enough, there was a tube. The operator said, don't panic, but one of your kidneys has been harvested. There's a ring of organ thieves operating in Manchester and they got to you. Paramedics are on their way. Don't move until they arrive. Quite, quite different audience reaction to, to that piece than the first one. So let's, let's test your yes, memory. Yes. Okay. So what city was Dave in? Manchester. Very good. <laughs> Noah. Mm. <Yeah. laughs> uh, how many drinks had Dave had when the woman one. approached him? One Correct. What was the last thing he remembered before waking up in the bathtub? Having a second drink with the woman. Correct. 
Why were his fingers numb and clumsy? He was an ice, I'm assuming, but I think it could be that he had passed out. It was the ice. Yeah. 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 Um, and what did the note say? Um, don't move, call 999. Yeah. So, you did much better recalling the story. It was easier. Yeah. Yeah. And I guarantee everyone else in this room found it easier. I guarantee you found it easier, didn't you? Yeah, you picked the wrong one. Go for red <laughs> next time. <laughs> okay, well, there, are, there was prizes for participating, so take that and thank you. Now that story about Dave in the bathtub, I guarantee that every one of you could sit in the pub tonight or sit with your flatmates tonight and relate that story with exactly the same amount of detail and elicit the same emotional response of, oh, oh. It's, it's a true story. It's one of those urban myths that spreads and it spreads because it's memorable. Now, why is it so much easier to remember that than facts and figures about the organ transplant trade? The emotional connection. And that's what I want to explore in a little more detail by looking at the language of the two pieces. So let's look first at the language of the WHO report. And I don't know if you've ever come, anyone ever come across the writer's diet? Ah, now, the Writer's Diet is this fantastic tool that you'll find online. It's free. And you can cut and paste any piece of text into this tool, and it diagnoses your writing as either lean or in heart attack territory, using a various factors, variety of factors. It was actually developed for academics, so it's perfect for people in your situation. And what I want you to do is look specifically at this bar, the nouns. Because one thing that makes academic writing, marks it out as academic, is a fondness for nouns, for those person, place, or thing words. But in particular, a particular type of noun called an abstract noun. Does everyone know what an abstract noun is? Or can someone tell me what an abstract noun is? It's a noun that refers to something that isn't concrete. Exactly. Yeah. A noun that you can't experience with any of the five senses. You can't touch it, you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it. And let's look at some of the abstract nouns in our WHO report. So things like transplantation, development, community, information. You can't smell availability. You can't taste a situation. You can't hear capacity. You can't experience it through any of your senses. Now, our story used nouns, but if we look at the nouns in our story, they're much more concrete. Kidneys, ice, bathtubs, thieves. And let's look at how this one looks in, rela in, the, uh, in the writer's diet tool. So far fewer nouns, but what's striking is the difference between nouns and verbs. It's much verbier, much more doing words, much more action. Killing panicking, harvesting, protruding, all these really, really vibrant words of action. And a few years ago, a cognitive scientist by the name of Véronique Boulanger did some research into the way human beings process language. Do we have any neuroscientists in the room who can recognize which bits of the brain are lighting up here. It's Broca Correct. Broca and Wernicke. And what are Broca and Wernicke's areas responsible for?
Okay. Great. So between the two of them, they give us the ability to process language. Yeah. Now, what um, Véronique Boulanger did was she presented subjects with a, a variety of phrases. And what she found was that when you present them with a phrase like, John grasped the object, second part of the brain lit up, or a third part. Can you tell us what that is? The motor cortex. So as far as the brain's concerned, it's almost experiencing that word grasped as if you were actually grasping an object. So this is why verbs are much more powerful than abstract nouns. So abstract nouns, you can't experience through them through any of your senses, whereas a verb lights up the brain in a whole different way. So that's why that true story is much more memorable. We actually are there with Dave in the bathtub. We're there with Dave feeling flattered at the attentions of a strange, attractive woman. And this ability to create a story can be very, very useful in your own teaching practice. Looking at my three factors, human, concrete, and dramatic, we see that the story was human. There were at least three people in the story, Dave, the woman, the operator. It's very concrete. You can almost feel your own fingers being clumsy with the ice. That brilliant detail of the tube protruding from the back. And the drama comes from his fate, sealed the moment he chose to accept the drink. And I did something similar with our two volunteers. They made it human. The envelopes made it concrete. And their fate was sealed the moment they chose red or blue. <laughs> All references to the Matrix are, of course, intended. OK, so let's look at those two storytellers that I introduced you to earlier on. Let's start with Lord Denning. And I want to look at Lord Denning by contrasting him with someone else. So in the blue corner, we have Baron Pearson who was a judge, and that's the only picture on the internet I could find of him, so that's why it's really terrible. Um, but he is described on Wikipedia as, and I quote, best remembered for his unspectacular but efficient and courteous chairmanship of industrial inquiries and royal commissions. So, you know, successful judge, but didn't set the world on fire. In the, red, in the blue corner, we have Lord Denning, one time master of the rolls, the highest legal office in England, and every law student's favorite judge. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the favorite item of clothing worn by law student, students around the world. The Lord Denning is my homeboy t-shirt. So, on the one hand, we have our polite, courteous, if unspectacular, Baron Pearson, and our homeboy, Denning. So if you turn to page 28 of your workbook, Baron Pearson and Lord Denning <clears throat> found themselves in 1970 hearing the case of Hins and Berry. Hins and Berry was a tort law case. That means it was a sort of personal injury case. And in any judgment in the Court of Appeal, the judges write down their reasons for coming to a decision. Each judge, in turn, writes down his reasons. And if you look at passage one, this is what Baron Pearson had to say. He, he opened his judgment with the following lines. This is a case of considerable importance because I think it's the first case in which the problem of assessing damages of this kind has come to the Court of Appeal. Perfectly well-written sentence. Sets it in context, tells other lawyers why they should continue reading this judgment, why it's important. Lord Denning, our homeboy, begins his judgment this way. It happened on April the 19th, 1964. It was bluebell time in Kent. Just reading those words gives me shivers. It's like the opening of a thriller, a novel, 
that sinister something happened and you know it's not going to be good. The beautiful detail of the bluebells, that delicate flower that blooms briefly for a few weeks in May. And the bluebells are important, by the way. The bluebells are the reason for the horrific accident that killed a father and maimed half his family. So that's why Lord Denning is every law student's favourite. It's one of the reasons Lord Denning is every law student's favourite judge. Because where Pearson, Baron Pearson, is writing for his fellow lawyers, Lord Denning is writing for us. He's writing for the public, and he starts by telling a story. He starts with the facts of the case rather than the law. Let's look at our next storyteller. Michael Lewis. Michael Lewis used to be an investment banker and he's written a lot of books about banking. And his most recent book is a fantastic book called Flash Boys. And Flash Boys is about the world of algorithmic trading. Um, if you don't know what algorithmic trading is, I've uh, got a little passage on and number three that explains a little bit about algorithmic trading. Algorithmic trading, also called algo trading, is the use of electronic platforms for entering trading orders with an algorithm, which executes pre-programmed trading instructions, accounting for a wide variety of variables such as timing, price and volume. I won't continue. Quite an abstract piece of writing there. Algorithms, prices, timings, volumes doesn't really give you a sense of what algorithmic trading is or why it's important. And let me read to you how Michael Lewis opens his book about algorithmic trading. By the summer of 2009, the line had a life of its own, and 2,000 men were digging and boring the strange home it needed to survive. 205 crews of eight men each, plus assorted advisors and inspectors, were now rising early to figure out how to blast a hole through some innocent mountain, or tunnel under some riverbed, or dig a trench beside a country road that lacked a roadside. All without ever answering the obvious question, why? The line was just a one and a half inch wide hard black plastic tube designed to shelter 400 hair thin strands of glass. But it already had the feeling of a living creature, a subterranean reptile with its peculiar needs and wants. It needed its burrow to be straight, maybe the most insistently straight path ever dug into the earth. It needed to connect a data center on the south side of Chicago to a stock exchange in northern New Jersey. Above all, apparently, it needed to be secret. What a brilliant opening. So he's taken this obscure world of algorithmic trading that most of us can't even picture or imagine and he humanizes it. We've got these workmen. He adds action. They're digging and tunneling and blasting holes. And that beautiful detail of the tube. What is it with tubes? They seem to appear in every story I tell. Um, that, that becomes a subterranean reptile. That sinister, threatening subterranean reptile that has needs and is demanding. The air of mystery, why? Why is this a secret? You can't stop, but you can't help but read on. And his books, even though they're about the most abstruse financial products and activities, are, they read like thrillers. So this is a man who knows how to communicate to a lay audience. And he makes you realize that it matters. If you read his books, you realize why algorithmic trading matters to the rest of us. So looking at that tube that becomes a, a metaphorical reptile, that brings me on to my second type of writer, which is the masters of metaphor. Can anyone tell me who this guy on the right is? He is, he does have a position in Cambridge. Sorry. On the right, on your left, on my, yes, uh, John, Norton. John Norton. And who is John Norton? Professor of So he writes a lot of stuff 
about technology. And he writes a lot of stuff for ordinary people in The Guardian and The Observer about technology and why technology matters. And one of the ideas that he was always trying to get across to people was the idea of open source software. Can anyone tell me what open source software is? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, yep, yep. And it's free. So by open, we mean it's freely available and anyone can adapt it to their own needs. But the important thing is they can only use it if they're prepared to pass that same freedom to adapt the, the software to other people. And John Norton said that I was always trying to get this idea across to people, and I'd be going, open source, it's great, it's important. And he'd be faced with a wall of blank faces. And he thought, well, how can I get this across? So what he did was the next time he went to talk to an audience about open source, he took a copy of this book. And on the screen, he put a slide of Delia Smith's recipe for Dauphin, Graf, Gratin, Dauphin Grattanoise, Grattanoise, Grattan Dauphinoise, that's it, the potato-y thing with lots of cream. Um, and he presented her recipe for Grattan Dauphinoise and said, now Delia Smith's recipe calls for double cream, but I don't like double cream, I want to use single cream. And he said, can you imagine a world in which if I, had to, if I wanted to replace double cream with single cream, I'd have to get Delia Smith's permission and possibly pay her a fee. Wouldn't that be absurd? That's what open source means. Suddenly, light bulbs pinging off. Um, and that's why metaphor, coming up with a metaphor to explain your subject can be really, really powerful because what you're doing is you're connecting an area that your audience has no experience of to something that they do. So you're making a connection between the unknown and the known. And in doing so, the unknown becomes familiar. Let me give you a couple of other examples. Can anyone tell me who the handsome chap in the middle is? Richard Feynman, yeah, yeah. I'd like to play you a short video of Richard Feynman talking about a very abstract concept. He's talking about the mathematics of a particular phenomenon. And he talks about it in metaphorical terms. So let's see if this works. Oh. The atoms like each other, the different degrees. Uh, oxygen, for instance, in the air would like to be next to carbon, and if they get near each other, they snap together. If they're not too close, though, they repel and they go apart, so they don't know that they could snap together. It's just as if you had a ball that was trying to climb a hill and there was a hole it could go into, like a volcano hole, a deep one. It's rolling along. It doesn't go down in the deep hole because if it starts to climb the hill and then rolls away again. But if you made it go fast enough, it'll fall into the hole. And so if you have something like wood in oxygen, there's carbon in the wood from a tree, and the oxygen comes and hits it carbon, but not hard enough. It just goes away again. And the air is always coming, nothing's happening. If you can get it faster by heating it up somehow, somewhere, somehow, get it started, a few of them come fast, they go over the top, so to speak, they come close enough to the carbon and snap in. And that gives a lot of jiggly motion which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms and they jiggle and they make mothers jiggle and you get a terrible catastrophe, which is one after the other. All these things are going faster and faster and snapping in and the whole thing is changing. That catastrophe is a fire. I love, I love the look on his face. He's so excited about this. Um, so what he does there is he... As I say, he describes the, the mathematics behind a fire in metaphorical terms, and he personifies 
the atoms. They become sentient creatures that can like each other and not know things. It's full of action, repelling, climbing, rolling along, bumping up against each other. So it's very human, it's very concrete, and of course we have the terrible catastrophe. So there's drama in there. Let me just give you another example of a really great use of metaphor. And this is an academic who is based here in Cambridge, and I don't have her name, I'm afraid. But she was talking on the Radio 4 program, more or less, about the recent rise in prisoners who had been sex offenders. And the then Justice Secretary, Chris Grayling, had claimed that the reason there were more sex offenders in prison was because he'd been cracking down and he was taking credit for it. And this is her response. Chris Grayling's right to say that there are 700 more sex offenders in prison this year than last year. But only about 80 of those are new cases entering the prison population. But so what, what, what explains the others? Well, when you think about the prison population, it's kind of helpful to think about it as a big bath, where how much water you've got in the bath depends on whether there was some in there already, and in terms of the prison population, that's most of it. How fast you've turned the taps on, and how firmly you've stuck the plug in. So at the moment, what we've got is a slight increase in the taps being turned on. So it's 80 more sex offenders coming in than in a comparable period in a previous year? Yeah. OK, so the flow rate's year. increased by, by 80. But releases have dropped dramatically in the same year. The plug's in more tightly. Indeed. The plug's in more tightly. Again, what, what she's doing there is connecting something that we might not be familiar with, the statistics behind the rise in prisoner numbers, and ties it to something we are all familiar with, the bath. Baths again, why do they keep cropping up? It's something that we can all relate to, the, bit, the plug being in more tightly, the taps being turned on more quickly. And that's one of the things about metaphor, is that when you're making an argument, I mean, there's a reason metaphor appears in lists of Latin rhetoric, and it's because metaphor has persuasive power. And let me give you one final example of metaphor. And this is the third chap on our initial screen um, who used metaphor to a very powerful extent, a powerful way to persuade people to adopt a certain point of view. And let me start by giving you a bit of background by pointing you to passage five on your handout. And this is from the Goldman Sachs, the investment bank Goldman Sachs website. And it says, Goldman Sachs is a leading global investment banking, securities and investment management firm that provides a wide range of financial services to a substantial and diversified client base that includes corporations, financial institutions, governments and high net worth individuals. So far, so, ugh. you know, it's very abstract. Banking, securities, investment management, lots of abstract nouns there. Here's how our third guy on our first screen described Goldman Sachs. The first thing you need to know about Goldman Sachs is that it's everywhere. The world's most powerful investment bank is a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Again, there's that mystery there. The first thing you need to know about Goldman Sachs, if that's the first thing, what else do I need to know about Goldman Sachs? This is how he opened a very, very famous article in 2010. And Goldman Sachs still hasn't shaken off the moniker of the Vampire Squid Bank. That brilliant action, the jamming of the blood funnel into anything that smells like money, it's full of verbs and the metaphor of the vampire squid. And I want to just show you another slide of the brain that talks about the effect of metaphor on the brain. So this was some research that was done in the States a few years ago. And again, we've got our Broca's area and Bernicke's area lighting up the language processing parts of the brain. And they will light up if you present a subject with a word like the singer had a pleasing voice. If However, you present a subject 
with the singer had a velvet voice, so introducing a metaphor, it's not literally velvet, it's only metaphorically velvet, which bit of the brain is lit, lit up now? The sensory cortex, yeah. So it's as if the brain is actually experiencing velvet. And it, we see the same effect if you swap uh, the man had rough hands with the man had leathery hands. So concretizing through metaphor. The persuasive power of metaphor, it's like we are actually experiencing that metaphor in a real concrete way. So I just want to quickly turn to my third type of writer. We've had our storytellers, we've had our masters of metaphor. And what you'll have noticed is that they actually do similar things. Storytelling uses a lot of metaphor, and metaphor tells a story. So my third type of writer is the super simplifiers. And I want to introduce you, I don't know, does anyone know this little online tool? This is a fantastic tool. Do I sense a recognition of that? So this is the UpGirl 5 text editor. And like the Writer's Diet, it's free. And you can cut and paste a bit of text in there. But what it doesn't like is any piece, any word that doesn't make it into the top 1,000 most common words in the English language. Presumably, 1,000 didn't make the cut because they describe it as the top 1,000 most used words. And trying to explain a com complex idea using only the top 1,000 most common words is a lot more difficult than it sounds. The reason it's called the UpGoer 5 text editor is because UpGoer is the word that they've had to come up with to describe rocket. And if you look at this, the UpGoer 5, this is the Saturn V rocket. And you'll see it's described only using those top thousand words. So, for example, the command module becomes the people box. The rocket fuel can, becomes stuff to burn to make the box with the people in it escape really fast. So, very cute, possibly a little bit cutesy. But every year there is a challenge where scientists are challenged to describe their work using this tool, using only the top thousand most common words. The woman in the corner here is the winner of the competition one year. Her name is Yasmin Hussein. And she won, as I say, the competition to describe her research using the UpGo5 text editor. And what Hussein studies is, and I'm going to have to remind myself here, is the role of chemotaxis in fertilization in marine invertebrates. And so she tried to describe her, the role of chemotaxis in fertilization in marine invertebrates, and she struggled. Chemotaxis, incidentally, for those of you who don't know, is the movement of an organism in response to a chemical stimulus. So she tried that. Chemotaxis obviously didn't make the cut. Stimulus didn't. Signal didn't. How did she... How could she explain this complex idea using only the most simple words? Well, this is what she came up with. This is chemotaxis in fertilization in marine invertebrates, in UpGoer 5. I study tiny things that are man and woman parts of an animal. The woman part talks and the man part listens. Not so sure about the gender bias there this, that plays on this idea that women are constantly talking, but, but we'll, we'll forgive her that. Um, but what has she done? She's, she's told a story. She's, she's created a metaphor. She's made it human. She's made it concrete and maybe a little bit dramatic too. Now, as I say, that tool, you might find it a little bit cutesy. But what a lot of scientists say about using this tool is that it forces them to question their own knowledge. It forces them to think more deeply about what they know and why their work matters. And I think this is probably the most important reason 
to be able to explain your work to a wider audience. It's not simply that that audience is going to benefit from your knowledge. It's that you might benefit yourself from that very, very process of explaining your work in a way that a non-expert can understand. And I want to leave you with a quote that really sort of captures this, this idea, and it might be one that you've heard before, but it's that, as Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't really understand it yourself. Thank you.